Hi everyone, welcome to this session. I am Venkatesh Imani from the Microsoft Gray Systems Lab. I am happy to be here at the data thread and I will be talking about PyFroid, a system we have been developing to scale data preparation using databases. I would like to thank all the amazing colleagues from various teams in Microsoft who have been part of this project. Before jumping into the talk, I want to mention our lab, the Gray Systems Lab, or GSL for short. We are an applied research lab within the Microsoft Azure Data Organization and led by Raghu Ramakrishnan, who is the CTO for Azure Data. We are a geographically distributed lab with presence in Redmond, Sunnyvale, and Madison, where we work closely with professors and students from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. We work in a bunch of different areas around database systems, including data-driven systems optimization, systems for data science and analytics, data provenance and governance, new hardware technologies, benchmarking, and so on. The work that I am presenting today is in the systems for data science area. And lastly, but importantly, we are always looking to hire great folks to work with. If you are interested, please reach out to carlo.curino at microsoft.com. With that, let's get started. Data preparation is a key step in the data science workflow. Some estimates say that data scientists spend more than 80% of their time on data preparation. Python is the most popular language used by data scientists. And Pandas is the most popular Python library for data processing. One reason for the popularity of Pandas is the DataFrames API. Pandas DataFrames provide easy to use incremental APIs for data processing. Pandas also integrates well with other popular data science libraries such as NumPy, sklearn, etc. Pandas work great for small data sets. However, as the data size grows, Pandas performance drops. Wes McKinney, the creator of Pandas, in a blog post, points out how Pandas was not designed for very large data sizes. To address this problem, there have been efforts on two fronts. On the Python side, there are frameworks that provide data frames APIs backed by more efficient data formats and execution engines at larger scales. The Arrow format is emerging as a common in-memory format for data processing across various engines. Dask and Modin provide uniform APIs that can run on all cores of a single machine or scale to a cluster. Vax uses memory mapping to enable analysis of larger than memory datasets. NVIDIA's RAPIDS framework runs data frame operations on GPUs. Finally, PySpark brings data frames into the Spark ecosystem. Koalas takes this step further by mimicking Pandas APIs that are compiled into PySpark queries. On the other side, in SQL, there are efforts such as Madlib and Spark's MLlib to augment the capabilities of SQL databases with data science operations. Most popular databases also provide Python interoperability within the SQL engine. The IBIS framework simplifies this by providing data frame APIs that are translated into SQL queries on relational backends. We use IBIS in our solution and we will discuss more about it a bit later in the talk. Most of these frameworks provide slightly different dialects of data frame APIs. This makes it difficult to leverage them without rewriting existing scripts. In our work, we built the PyFroid system to improve Pandas by using database technologies. The core idea is to automatically translate imperative Python pandas programs into SQL queries. For example, the program on the top is translated into the query at the bottom. In this case, the program reads data from a database table. Then, it filters bad rows, followed by data extraction and aggregation operations. These operations across multiple lines are translated into a single query with the corresponding SQL operations. To use our system, all a user needs to do is import the PyFroid library in place of Pandas. PyFroid is a drop-in replacement for Pandas, so no other changes are required. This way, it is easy to use our system to optimize existing programs as well. 
as the query is executed at the database, we can take advantage of the database query planner and optimizer. Further, data transfer is reduced as only processed data needs to move out of the database. We conducted an analysis of all the Pandas data frame operations. For commonly used parameter options, out of 217 methods, around half of them can be translated into SQL queries. Around 10% can be translated to run at the database using PL SQL constructs or stored procedures. In all, using a conservative estimate, around 70% of the operations can be optimized to run at the database. However, translating pandas to SQL is not straightforward. There are multiple challenges involved. Pandas executes each operation eagerly, whereas query translation requires multiple lines of code to be lazily accumulated into a single SQL query. Not every data frame operation can be translated into SQL. So, in our work, we support dual inlets. This means that for those fragments of Pandas code that cannot be translated to SQL, we support execution within the Pandas engine itself. Data frame indexes impose an implicit ordering on the data. This is in contrast to SQL, where such an ordering is not imposed unless there is an explicit order by clause. Some data frame APIs may look similar to SQL operations, but the semantics are slightly different. For instance, look at the data frame group by operation shown here. Intuitively, we would expect this to translate into a SQL query that computes count star grouped by attribute A. However, in Pandas, this actually computes the count of every column in the data frame grouped by A. We need to use the table schema to correctly translate these operations. And lastly, we need to ensure that the interop between Pandas and SQL happens in a manner that reduces resource utilization. All right, let's now see how our translation system works. Our Pandas to SQL translation is based on lazy evaluation. The entry point to our system is the pyfroid.pandas library, which reroutes all Pandas API calls to our system. When a method is invoked, our system first checks if the corresponding operation along with the provided parameter values is supported for SQL translation. If yes, then the SQL equivalent of the operation is added to an intermediate representation representing the query tree. We use the IBIS framework's intermediate representations and I will talk about it in the next slide. We call the declarative query expression as dex. If the operation cannot be translated to SQL, then it needs to be executed in the pandas engine itself. However, instead of eagerly executing the operation, we add the operation along with arguments to a batch of pending operations. Along with these operations, we store a reference to the subquery on top of which these operations need to execute. We call the batch of pending operations as max. As the program execution continues, this process repeats. Note that using this mechanism, we do not actively execute any operations except to add it to the query tree or to the batch of pending operations. When the method requires the contents of the data frame computed both in the database and pandas, say, by accessing multiple columns. At that point, we create the data frame as follows. First, we obtain the SQL query for the DEX and execute it to obtain DF1. Then, we do the same for the subquery on top of which the pending operations need to execute. Let's call this subDF. <coughs> Next, we execute each pending operation to subDF in the order they appeared inside the pandas engine. This gives us df2. We then merge df1 and df2 inside the pandas engine to obtain the final resultant data frame df. This entire process of splitting the computation and putting together the results is transparent to the user. We call our approach hybrid lazy evaluation because we perform lazy evaluation on two fronts. For parts that can be translated to SQL, lazily evaluated SQL queries, for parts that cannot, lazily evaluated pandas operations. With the overall algorithm in mind, let's now move on to the individual parts. As we saw in the previous slide, 
We use IBIS intermediate representations as the query tree for pandas operations that can be translated to SQL. At our lab, we have the practice of naming projects after birds, so it definitely helped that IBIS is also named similarly. Jokes aside, IBIS is a great fit for our use case because it provides a simple interface similar to data frames for constructing these intermediate representations or IRs. The IR contains many commonly used operations, but in our work, we mainly use the relational algebra operators provided by IBIS. Most importantly, the IR supports lazy evaluation. Also, the IRs can be easily translated into many SQL dialects, either through SQL alchemy or separate SQL generating projects. At a high level, we translate Pandas APIs into IBIS expressions using IBIS APIs. We then generate the required SQL from the IBIS expression. Let us now see a walkthrough of how SQL query is constructed. The program shown here is the Pandas program we saw earlier that computes the number of taxi trips per weekday. To keep things simple, we have selected an example where all the operations can be translated into SQL. Line 1 imports our PyFroid library. In line 2, the table NYC taxi is read into DF. This gets translated into a scan of the table in the IBIS IR. The IR is returned back to the program as a result of the read CSV operation. In line 3, all data frame rows containing fair amount less than or equal to 0 are filtered out. This gets translated into a selection on top of the scan. The expression for DF at the end of line 3 is the expression rooted at select and is returned to the program as the result of the filter operation. Similarly, the operations lines 4 and 5 are translated into corresponding IBIS operators and at the end of line 5, the accumulated expression for DF contains all the operators corresponding to operations in line 2 to 5. In line 6, the contents of the data frame are required to be printed. So, the expression constructed so far is translated into a SQL query, the query is executed and the result is returned to the program in the form of a pandas data frame. At each point in the program, the expression for a variable, say DF in this case, contains all the operations required to compute the value of df. However, none of these operations are executed until the contents of the data frame are required. As you can see in this case, only the aggregated results need to be transferred, which is usually much less than the entire data. In addition to using the IBIS IRs, we developed a few extensions to handle Pandas APIs not supported by IBIS. Firstly, we have a dual engine hybrid evaluation strategy that uses the pandas engine for operations that are not pushed down into SQL. This ensures that existing scripts run to completion without rewriting. Secondly, we support pandas index operations by maintaining a row num column that uniquely identifies each table row even in the absence of a primary key. Interestingly, in an analysis that we conducted on top 500 Kaggle datasets, we found that the data ordering is correlated with the order of the first column in around 70% of the datasets. So, optionally, we enable users to specify to use the first column as the index for better performance. Thirdly, we use the table schema and metadata to correctly translate operations such as group by and others for which the semantics in pandas and SQL are slightly different. Series operations are translated as operations on a single column. An interesting side effect of imperative to declarative translation is that when a variable is used multiple times, it gets translated into multiple repetitions of the same sub-expression. For example, in the code shown here, the expression for mean is repeated twice in the expression for near. This eventually gets translated into repeated sub-queries in the SQL query, which is redundant and inefficient. If the database optimizer is not able to identify and eliminate these common sub-expressions, we have mechanisms to generate queries with repeated subqueries extracted as common table expressions using the with clause in SQL. In the last few slides, we saw how the pandas code is translated into SQL queries. Let us now consider another example to see how we handle cases when some pandas operations have no SQL counterpart. 
The example shown here is taken from a Kaggle notebook that uses NYC parking tickets data. We have modified it to use uh, Pyfroid instead of Pandas. The script contains Pandas operations such as head, replace, group by, count, etc. In line 5, there is an operation that is Pandas specific, the errors equal to course operation. As a result, the computation of issue date column in line 5 cannot be pushed down into SQL. However, the way the user has written this program, the issue date column is not used until line 8. Even then, only a part of the data frame is accessed. On the right side, we are showing the relevant notebook state that shows abridged versions of expressions for each variable as it gets executed by our PyFraud system. Star denotes that in that line, the starred expression is executed to get the contents of the data frame. We see that in line 5, a mix, that is, a batched pandas operation is created for issue date. We did not show the details here, but the batch would contain reference to the two date time method and the argument names and values for format and errors. In line 8, the columns issue date and summons number from the data frame are accessed. Issue date contains batched pandas operations, hence it belongs to the pandas component of PyFraud, whereas summons number belongs to the SQL component. At this point, the individual data frames for these columns are obtained and joined using the row num column. <clears throat> One thing to highlight here is that our hybrid evaluation strategy drastically reduces the memory footprint of the script execution. In this example, we only fully retrieved two columns from the file, namely issue date and summons number. The other operations are either top end rows or aggregations, which also usually contain much fewer rows. This is extremely useful in scaling the amount of data that can be analyzed on low resource systems. That brings us to the end of PyFroid internals. Next, we will look at two use cases of how PyFroid can help speed up and scale pandas. The first use case is when the data is in a cloud warehouse. Oftentimes, data that is in a warehouse is analyzed by multiple engines. For instance, users of Azure Synapse have access to both Azure SQL and Spark engines. Some queries may be better suited for a particular engine, but it is very difficult for the user to manually make this choice. The MagPy system envisions a solution to this by providing a uniform Python pandas interface for users to specify their computations. Using PyFroid, these operations are translated into various database backend queries. An ML powered backend selection algorithm selects the best backend for the query based on past workloads. Commonly seen data frames across engines are cached using a common data format such as Arrow. As an example, let us consider two big data engines in Microsoft, SQL Data Warehouse and Scope. Using the SQL DW backend in IBIS, we are able to translate Pandas programs into IBIS and then into T-SQL queries. Eventually, this gets translated as a SQL DW execution plan. Alternatively, if our engine chose Scope as the best engine, then using the Scope backend for IBIS, which we have added as part of our efforts, we can translate the same program into a Scope query and execute it as a Scope plan. This vision of a uniform interface that can automatically be pushed down into cloud engines is enabled by PyFraud's capabilities to translate pandas into SQL. We compared the performance of the taxi trips analysis on pandas and PyFroid using push down to SQL DW engine. The left chart shows the speed up compared to pandas as the number of rows in the dataset is increased. The right chart shows the speed up as the query complexity is increased by joining the dataset with a subset of itself. In both cases, we see that the gains due to PyFraud are huge. The next use case we will discuss is how PyFraud can scale Pandas workloads on commodity workstations, which have very different characteristics compared to warehouse engines. So, why are commodity workstations important in the context of data analysis and data preparation? Although big data engines are great for analyzing terabytes or petabytes of data, a huge fraction of data science users work on datasets that are much smaller, often in the range of gigabytes, where 
The data can fit on a single laptop or their workstation. This data is often not already loaded into a database, but it's in files such as CSV or Parquet. Pandas uses a single core and requires almost 5 to 10 times RAM as the data size. This severely limits the amount of data that users can analyze on their laptops or workstations using Pandas. Existing frameworks to improve Pandas have focused on giving speedups using all cores, but they require lots and lots of RAM, which is not available to users. So, in a nutshell, an efficient solution for single node limited RAM systems with a few CPU cores is missing. Fortunately, this is addressed by PyFroid using pushdown to an embedded database. We have implemented pushdown from pandas into DuckDB using PyFroid. In summary, this enables users to analyze three to five times more data on the same machine compared to using pandas. When compared to other frameworks such as Dask, PyFroid consumes much less resources. On a top voted Kaggle notebook, we ran the data preparation operations using Pandas, Dask, Modin, and PyFroid with DuckDB pushdown. The machine has 16 GB RAM and 4 cores. The chart here shows the comparison of total time taken to run the operations as we vary the data size from the original data size to over 5 GB. As we can see, at small data sizes, the blue line corresponding to Pandas is the fastest. However, this quickly changes as the data size reaches around one fifth of the RAM and Pandas starts failing. Frameworks such as Modin internally use Pandas data frames, so they also fail even as the data size increases slightly in the absence of lots of RAM. Dask and PyFroid are able to successfully execute the script at all data sizes. However, as we can see, PyFroid is faster than Dask and PyFroid keeps getting better as the data size increases. The chart on the right shows a comparison of resource utilization between Dask and PyFroid. As we can see, both in terms of memory utilization and CPU utilization, PyFroid consumes less resources than Dask while providing better performance. That brings us to the end of this talk. To summarize, PyFroid can bring significant benefits to Pandas users. We discussed our techniques involving a hybrid lazy evaluation strategy using SQL and Pandas engines. Early evaluation results are promising and we are working on more experiments. Thanks so much for your time. For more details on the project, feel free to reach out to me at venkatesh.imani at microsoft.com. Have a great day. Thank you.